Welcome to the 37th annual Las Vegas Perspective. My name is Jonas Peterson. I'm the CEO of the Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance, and I am so excited. I am honored to be your host this morning. Truth is, this is my favorite event of the entire year. And thanks to your support, thanks to your overwhelming support, um, this turned out to be a really hot ticket this year. I don't know if you guys saw this, uh, but we sold out not a week ahead of time, not two weeks, but over a month in advance, right? Is that worth it? Thank you, thank you. Not only that, but I'm glad you guys are here. We had to turn away around 100 that wanted to be with us this morning, so congratulations to you for making the cut early. Thank you for coming out. But seriously, this, this tells us two things. One, we're probably gonna need to look at a bigger room next year. And two, more importantly, that we're on the right track to deliver on the brand promise for perspective. That brand promise is to be Southern Nevada's premier source for community and economic information analysis and forecasting. Now, for this morning, we've been working with our Perspective Council to raise the bar once again. And I am excited for what we have in store for you. Let me tell you a little bit about what we have planned. It starts with the Perspective data book that you received when you came in this morning. In that book, you will find a comprehensive overview of the market as it exists today. It's jam-packed with information and statistics that you need to know to understand our community, our economy, and where it's going. That's just the beginning. This year, we've put in new content from dozens of community and business leaders so that you can hear in their own words about major projects and priorities that they expect for the next 12 months. These are the, the big organizations in our region, from higher education to our cities, to RTC, to the Water Authority, and much more. In addition, in the book, we've retooled our polling to do a deeper dive into the attitudes and opinions of the Southern Nevada workforce. We want you to be able to understand what the business community is thinking on key topics, sometimes controversial topics, like marijuana, stadium development, minimum wage, and much more. Also, in the book, you got forecast content where we pull in subject matter experts, dozens of subject matter experts, and ask them to give their prediction on what's gonna happen in the economy over the next 12 months. All that packed into the book, and if we can advance, all right, so it starts with the book. During the event today, we've got a powerhouse lineup for you of speakers that are gonna do a deep dive into our economy, into advancing the business of healthcare, and a look at the future of gaming. You, it, this is a powerhouse group of, of speakers. And it doesn't stop there. As you know, with Perspective, we want you to be equipped with the latest information and analysis throughout the year. So, as our gift to you, we're going to be sending each of you that are here this morning quarterly newsletters with more data analysis on topics like education, infrastructure, and competitiveness throughout the year. And we're also extending your access to the LBGA data portal. You probably remember last year we showcased this new product. This is an online tool that has real-time data. Thousands of indicators and data points all updated in real-time along with community mapping and much more. This is our gift to you as well, where if you're here this morning, we want you to be able to have this so you will receive an email with a one-year subscription to the data portal. And one last thing. As you leave this morning, we have the latest project from our research center. We're calling it the Southern Nevada Community Map. This is not an ordinary map. You'll grab it on, on your way out. I wanna tell you how it was created. Uh, we approached our friends at, an, at Applied Analysis and we asked them, can you help us make a map that tells the future? We expected them to say no, because that's, that's a ridiculous request. They said yes, they always do, and the result is a map that showcases the billions of dollars of capital investment that we expect to move forward along the Strip, the billions more that's moving in our economy through private businesses around the region, new school construction, key assets, and so much more. 
take a, take a close look at that map. When you receive it on the way out, I think you will agree that it is awesome. Now, we hope all this content, it's designed to add value to you so that through the upcoming year, you can make better decisions. At LVJ, we believe that information is the currency of economic development. And when we can equip leaders like you with better information, we as a team will make better decisions, have a stronger community, and have a stronger economy. That's what perspective is all about. All right, so again, thank you for coming this morning. I want to recognize a very special group. Make sure I get this right, so we'll pull out the cards for this. This is our Perspective Council. The Perspective Council is responsible for leading everything you see here. The event, the speakers, the content, they're not only sponsors, but they're involved in the process. This is an exceptional group, and I want to recognize them and then give them each a big round of applause. It starts with Cox Communications. Derek Hill and your team, could you guys stand up? Where are you guys at? I just. So let me tell you just a little bit. Derek is our vice chairman at LVGEA. Cox is our pinnacle level investor. And they're also on the Perspective Council. An amazing group. Thank you so much. We appreciate you guys, Derek. You are amazing. Thank you. Eight News Now. Lisa Howfield and the team. Guys, stand up. Where you, there you are. Stand up. Now, take a look at the crowd that Lisa brings with. I believe this is the largest group uh, you know, from 8 News Now that we have at Perspective this morning. So thank you so much. We, we appreciate it. Awesome. At Nevada State Bank, Shannon Peterson and the team. Where are we going, guys? There they are. Shannon's one of our new board members at LVGA. Thank you so much for the support, a champion for our community. At Wells Fargo, Kirk Clausen and the team. Stand on up, guys. Kachi. Kirk is on our executive committee at LVGA, a rock star for this community, always saying yes. Kirk, you are amazing. Thank you. And last but not least, the team at Applied Analysis. Guys, stand up. Jeremy, Brian, Rachel, Melanie, the team. This is our go-to group. This is the brains behind uh, perspective. Perspective, I want you to know they always say yes. They're always striving to make this better. And they blow us away when we ask for crazy research requests. They find a way to make it happen. Uh, we love you guys. Thank you so much. All right, so that is our Perspective Council. We also got a group of in-kind investors that stepped up this year. Let me read them off. We'll give them a round of applause at the end for helping us get the word out about this event. We got KNPR, Lotus Broadcasting, Elite Media, and Vegas PBS. Let's give a round of applause for this group. Thank you. There's a lot of elected officials in the room. I caught a few of you as you were, you were coming in, so this is probably an incomplete list, but I'm going to give it a shot. We've got Mayor-elect Deborah March from Henderson here. Stand on up. <laughs> Councilman John Mars, I believe, is with us this morning. Councilman Dan Stewart. Councilman Stavros Anthony and Commissioner Susan Brager. Welcome. Elected officials, stand on up if I missed anybody. All right, now it's the fun part. We get to kick off the party. We're gonna invite up our first panel. Before I do that though, uh, I wanna remind you to join the conversation on Twitter, hashtag LV Perspective. If you do that, I think there's even on the, the tent on your table, you can ask questions following our panel. You can be a part of the discussion. In fact, I think we're gonna throw up a live Twitter wall uh, in just a little bit, so you will see that firsthand. Here's our first panel. It's on advancing the business of healthcare. Why? Because there are amazing things happening in this, in this industry right now. In fact, if you look at our economy, it's the fastest jobs reducing segment. There's major projects planned that you're going to hear about. And to tell you about that, we've got a rock star group of, of panelists. Let's start it off. Betsy Fretwell from the city of Las Vegas, city manager Betsy, uh, could you come join us? From UNLV. 
We got the founding dean of the medical school, Dr. Barbara Atkinson. Welcome. Come join us. Welcome. From Toro University, the one and only Shelley Berkeley. Yeah. <laughs> and Doug Geinzer from Las Vegas Heels, a man who knows a lot about healthcare. Welcome, welcome. All right. All right. Good morning. How are we doing? Excellent. Excellent. So, Betsy, if we could, I would like to uh, to kick it off with you. Have you start okay. us off. Um, and here's the question. Could you give us the big, the big picture? Why is healthcare important to growing our economy? And also, what, what is the city of Las Vegas uh, doing in particular to grow this industry? Oh, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, healthcare is a critical industry for us. One, we're underweighted in it. And everyone knows that when we do our surveys at the city of Las Vegas, that there is always a concern about access and quality. Uh, and so we know that we have incredible quality here in town, but we do have an access issue, and many of the panelists who are here with me today are working to improve that access by creating new doctors and new medical professionals that will help us. Uh, it also helps bolster our economy. Uh, these are good-paying jobs, people who are well-educated, and they help us grow and diversify. And that's been a critical component for the city of Las Vegas. Most recently, we put together a medical district advisory board about three or four years ago at the request of Councilwoman Tarkanian and Mayor Carolyn Goodman. We did that because we have one of the single largest footprints of medical care and service delivery in the middle of the city of Las Vegas. So of the distribution of health care uh, providers in the community, we represent 64% of them right in the medical district in the heart of the city of Las Vegas. And if you're trying to figure out where that medical district is, it's right by UMC. So if you can picture that, right along Charleston, near Rancho, near I-15, and Alta. The council embarked upon a plan to expand that district, and we've added over 400 acres to that 200 acres so that we have plenty of room for expansion. The council also adopted an incredible master plan for that area in partnership with all the institutional providers in that 200 original acres and the expanded area that will bring us over 600 acres of medical district development. This is critically important because if the city is investing wisely in infrastructure and all of the, the providers in the area are partnering on things that have a common good to them, so not programmatic decisions, not whether or not Dr. Atkinson has 60 or 80 students per class, but really how are we providing street networks and a variety of other infrastructure that helps drive the cost down to providing quality and affordable health care to our community? It can happen in the health district, in the uh, medical district, through our health care providers. We really feel like this is an important play for the city's economic development plan, and that's what we have been focusing on to make a huge difference for our entire community. And we believe that we can be the hub. This doesn't replace what needs to be happening throughout the community. This accentuates what needs to be happening throughout the community and creates a, a hub in the middle of the city where everybody can get to it for those things that we can only have one of, for instance. And those are the kinds of things that we've been pursuing at the city we have great hopes for the medical school and what it brings to that district. We're thrilled that the medical education building is going to be there. And we have high hopes for additional expansion in that area as the medical school grows. Those are the things we're focusing in on at the city of Las Vegas. Beautiful. Dr. Atkinson, you're up next. We know that uh, the, our first class at the School of Medicine is coming online this summer. Mm -hmm. Could you give us a taste of the um, kind of what's next? What are the major steps? What are you excited about? Well, I'm excited about it all, all right. uh, but I'm excited about the class first. I just have to tell you quickly, 
It's 60 students. They're starting on July 17th. They're starting with EMT training. But of those 60 students, they are all from Nevada or they have very strong ties to Nevada. We just interviewed Nevada students. We had over 900 applicants and 300 of them were from Nevada. So we didn't even have to go beyond that. And that's exciting in itself. Yeah. Um, so they're getting ready to start. What we're really working on this summer, too, is setting up the clinical enterprise. So on July 1st, the people who were the faculty at UNR's School of Medicine, which, who were practicing in Las Vegas, are all moving over to be UNLV faculty. So that's about 125 physicians and another 25 or so uh, administrators. And so they practice in the medical district mostly, although they have a few other sites as well. They'll be practicing under UNLV medicine starting then. And so we have to convert those practices into a, a whole different level of care, a, a, a level of care that really is one that you would be proud to come to. So that's a, a major effort that's going on right now, recontracting everything, everything from getting telephones, EMRs, patient records ready to move over. It's a big deal to move that many people. Besides them moving over, they have 300 practice plan employees, the front desk, the billing people, everybody else that goes with the practice, they're coming over, and 300 residents are moving over to become UNLV residents. So we're going from having about 80 uh, faculty and staff in the School of Medicine to over 800 on July 1st. So that's a, a pretty big deal. That's about a quarter of what UNLV is altogether. So adding that many new people is, is, is really exciting. But the practice is going to be very exciting, but it'll take us a little while to get it to where it needs to be. Beside that, we're working on starting that medical education building. And I have to say the city has been an incredible partner with us on this. And the county has as well. The county gave us nine acres of land in the medical district. We've already moved all our current faculty to the medical district, so we are clearly in the medical district now. We are in the second phase of design of the building, where, as you've probably read in the papers, looking for our $100 million donor. We hope we'll be able to say we have that. We hope we'll be able to actually break ground on the building. Um, I hope in the fall, we'll see. Uh, so that's going on. Uh, and I think those are probably the major efforts. We do have a research effort going on, and that's one that's really important for the community. It's sort of trailing to a certain degree everything else because we did education first, clinical second, and research third, but it's coming. We just celebrated a big uh, Mountain West uh, conglomeration of people who are all part of a research team that works together to build research infrastructure. And that's what's really going to drive the economic piece of the healthcare district. And I'll just say that the projection of a medical school in a, in a medical district uh, with everything it brings is something like a $3.6 billion a year, a year uh, economic benefit to the community and should have something like 22,000 new jobs within the next 15 years. So that's what awesome. we're up to. Awesome. All right, Shelly, I'm coming your way actually for the next one. So Shelly, you have a unique perspective, right? You've been involved in the highest levels of government and in medical education. I wanna ask for your thoughts on, on one of those topics that's critical, involves both those, graduate medical education. I know our state legislature in particular is taking a look at this. What is it? Why do we need more of it? Could you give us your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, thank you very much, and thanks for having me. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, GME is a very important issue and very critical to the state of Nevada if we are going to attract doctors and keep them here. Um, when you graduate medical school, you still cannot practice medicine. You have a minimum of three more years of training, which is your residencies, graduate medical education. Now, years ago, uh, graduate medical education dollars, how do we pay for GME? Comes out of Medicare funding from the feds. Years ago, it was capped. 
which means if you're an East Coast state that has lots of GME, you continued getting funding. For a growth state like Nevada, where we've had a huge population explosion, it's been devastating to us because the GME is capped. There's no funding from the feds. So, or very limited funding from the feds. So understanding that you need three more years of training before you can practice medicine, it is essential that the state of Nevada create its own GME. And so the governor, and I am very high on Governor Sandoval for a whole host of reasons, but uh, he understood that we needed to create and spend some money on the state level in order to create GME. So last legislative session, he in, or in his budget was a $10 million appropriation to create primary care GMEs. Why is that important? Because the greatest shortage of doctors, although we have shortages across the board, greatest shortage of doctors is primary care physicians. And consequently, um, we were able to utilize that $10 million, $5 million each year of the biennium, to create graduate medical education. Now, in this legislative session, he, um, again, in his budget was another $10 million. I've been tracking it in the legislature, and the legislature, I believe, when their budget is put to bed, the $10 million will survive, and we will be able to use it for GME. It is very important that it stays in primary care, because that is the greatest need in the state of Nevada. Let me uh, quickly end with this, and it's easy to understand. Why is GME here in Nevada important? Because 70% of doctors end up practicing where they do their GME, their graduate medical education. If we don't have enough graduate medical education in the state of Nevada, these young men and women, these future doctors, end up going away, and unless they have a tie with the state of Nevada, they're not coming back, and it makes sense. They're making contacts in the medical community, they're getting married, they're establishing ties in the community that they're getting, having their residencies. And a simple way to understand this. Toro University graduates 135 future doctors every year. We're very proud of that. We had 3,700 applications for 135 slots this year. We can afford to be very selective of who we admit into our program. If we admit you, we expect you to graduate, and we're going to do everything we can to help you. We have 30 residencies. Uh, well, 90, but 30, 30, 30, because it's 30 a year, with, Valley, with the Valley Health System. That means that if we fill every residency with a Toro student, 105 of my graduates of future doctors have to leave the state of Nevada in order to get their training. That is insane. And Barbara and I have talked about this a lot. You could have a new medical school. You could have 20 new medical schools. We're all still competing for the same small number of residencies. Until this state gets more residencies, we are not, not going to be able to Keep doctors here. And it's simple math, and it doesn't take a genius to figure this out. So if you ask, and maybe Jonas is going to ask this later, what can I do? Call your legislator. We know them. That's the beauty of Nevada. Tell them to make sure that GME yeah. money, primary care physicians, is in the budget this year so we can start more uh, residencies in the following few years. So important. So important, audience. So there. Thank you. <laughs> All right. All right. Doug, you're up next. Want to hop into your world for a little bit. Um, the audience, when they leave today, they're going to look at that community map and they're going to see hospitals, clinics springing up all over uh, the valley. Could you tell us a little bit what, what's driving this trend? Maybe share a few examples? Sure. So it's a lot of things. Um, during the Great Recession, uh, we went into that underbedded as a community. Uh, we just flat out did not have a bed, enough beds to serve the community uh, that's here. Uh, during that recession, um, our unemployment rates went up, therefore our uninsured went up. 
So a lot of folks just didn't have access to care because of that. Um, we uh, were the first state or the first uh, Republican governor that approved the expansion of Medicaid through the Affordable Care Act. Uh, that brought in 300,000 new additionally insured. So these 300,000 needed a place to access care. Uh, and what that did is it also provided a patient that would present themselves at the hospitals that now had a payer source. Not quite at the level that they need to to be profitable, but they had a payer source attached to them. Um, so everybody started growing again. At the same time, some other things happened where they started, uh, they corrected the reimbursement rate for inpatient behavioral health. Uh, so you saw some readjustment around the community. So now you're watching all of these uh, facilities and all of these systems grow. I think a lot of the growth that's going on in the medical district and with the, the UNLV School of Medicine uh, is going to continue. And, and we're building out now to embrace and be prepared for a major transformation into academic medicine. So as that happens and more residents are coming through and 70% of those are staying here, they're going to be opening up practices. Uh, then we'll start developing specialty and subspecialty programs and fellowship programs to bring on the, the access to care that we desperately need. Uh, you're seeing other systems such as uh, uh, yesterday there was a great presentation from the folks from Union Village uh, and Henderson Hospital. That was a hospital that was opened up just a year ago and they're already expanding. They're already at that capacity. Uh, every single hospital in this town is growing at some rate, whether it's Centennial, Spring Valley, Mountain View, Sunrise is building a new tower. You're seeing the introduction of standalone ERs. You're seeing the introduction of uh, community hospitals or micro hospitals. And this is all improving access to care because we all want to access care where it's closest to where we live. Uh, and you're gonna see a huge transformation of this for years to come. Uh, so I, I think it's an exciting time for medicine in Las Vegas. I think the great work that's being done by our governor with the expansion of graduate medical education, what's happening with UNLV Medicine, what's going on at the medical district. Uh, healthcare is now top of mind and tip of tongue. Uh, it's happening, it's growing, and it's driving this community. And it's going to require strengthening that healthcare pillar for true economic diversification to happen. Because as we're trying to recruit, attract, and expand companies to come here, those executives want to offer their family, their executives' families, and all of their employees and their families good health care and good education. And so I think the healthcare community has really come together to help provide that part of the equation. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, panel, I'm going to open up the next question. Everybody, this is a little bit of a hot button issue uh, reimbursement rates. Um, could you guys, could you tell us about what's going on with reimbursement rates? How do we stack up to other markets, why is it important? What, what can we do about it? So I'll jump in there, sorry right. to hog the microphone a little bit and uh, a little bit of a, a, a selfish plug. So Las Vegas Heels uh, has a reimbursement survey out on the street and we partnered up with the LVGEA on this. So let me explain why reimbursements is so important. Economic development really is job creation, okay? And workforce development, it's what it comes down to. In workforce development, you've got two parts of that equation, recruitment of a workforce and retention of a workforce. We have worked extremely hard over the course of the last four years to expand our physician pipeline. Uh, so the expansion of graduate medical education, to put some perspective to that, we're going from programs existing in three hospitals. By the end of this year, we should probably have programs in 12 hospitals, which is gigantic. And so we've spent all this time developing this pipeline of physicians with the new medical school, with the expansion of Toro and everything that's going on, we now need to focus our attention to the retention part of the equation. And that's keeping them here. And the residency programs get them here. What keeps doctors here is their pay. And their pay is directly tied to reimbursement rates. So if we are not reimbursing them adequately, all of this infrastructure that we've been building over the last five years is for naught. So we have to get this part of the equation right. Nevada as a whole is one of the worst reimbursed markets in the entire country. So physicians have the choice because they're in demand everywhere. The physician shortage is not just in Nevada. It is in every single state. And so doctors have choices where they could live. And when they could go to a neighboring state, 
and they can earn 40% more and see less patients and do what they truly care about, and that is delivering exceptional patient care, spending time with the patients, they could choose where they're gonna go. So in order for Nevada to have a competitive advantage, we must address reimbursement rates. If we don't get that right, we're gonna have serious, serious challenges. Well, um, my, uh, my husband is a nephrologist. They, uh, when I first started dating him, I thought that was sex with dead people. It's not. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, he's, he's a kidney doctor. Thank God, a kidney doctor. And my stepdaughter is a primary care physician. So we do health care in our family. It's a very simple thing, and Doug hit on it. Uh, reimbursement is important because doctors like to eat and support their families. And if the reimbursement rates are low, they are going to go elsewhere. But it also has a lot to do with the insurance companies who are negotiating the rates with the doctors. And because there is very few choices um, of um, uh, private health insurers, the insurance companies can pretty well determine what they are going to pay for the services if the doctor wants to be in their network. And so uh, my husband is a managing doctor of his group. There's 33 doctors, 700 employees in his group. It's a big practice. But when he's dealing with the insurance companies, they're offering to reimburse him 50% of Medicare, which is pathetic anyway. Medicare is one of his high pays. Um, not one of his low pays. And, you know, they said, look, you know, we're, um, we just signed a deal with your competitor and we're giving them 50% 50, uh, 50 of Medicare. You want it or you don't want it. Now, Larry's group's going to want to be part of that network too. So those primary care physicians can um, refer their patient to, uh, to whoever, whatever doctor's in that network. So it has a lot to do with lack of competition with insurance companies offering this type of insurance, uh, medical insurance, to our, uh, I guess, our fellow citizens. That's huge. Another thing that is going to be devastating for this state, uh, if um, President Trump's proposal to cut $800 billion out of Medicaid goes through. I sincerely doubt it will. It is going to be devastating for the state of Nevada because that's how poor people get their services. And it's important to know this in conclusion. Just because you don't have health insurance doesn't mean you don't get sick. You wait until you get really sick and you end up in the emergency rooms of the hospitals. What is the most expensive type of treatment? Emergency room treatment. And there is a reason that UMC is no longer having $70 million yearly deficits. They're not in the red anymore. And that's because Obamacare expanded Medicaid. Governor Sandoval agreed that they should, that the state of Nevada should expand its Medicaid program. And as the reimbursement from the feds gets lower and lower, the cost to the taxpayers of the state of Nevada is going to rise and rise and rise. It could be a big budget buster. And for Somebody like Barbara, who needs those state dollars, of course, uh, Toro doesn't take any state or federal money. <clears throat> However, <laughs> for, uh, yes, for um, a medical school that's dependent on state funding, um, the fact that Medicaid is going to be cut is really going to hurt because they're going to have to make up the shortfall and things like UNLV Medical School and so many other programs that we as citizens expect from our government aren't going to are going to be cut because this is a low tax state and our fellow citizens don't want their taxes increased. All right, thank you, thank you. We've got uh, so many more questions that I want to ask, but it's important that we open it up to you guys. So this is the segment uh, where, let's see if we can't fit in some questions from uh, Twitter, and then we're gonna have a roving microphone as well. Twitter's not working, okay. <laughs> Our feed is not working. All right, well, so this is, this is good to know. <laughs> um, so from the audience, do we have a question for this panel? 
anybody will come get you with the microphone. While you're waiting, can I make a, yeah, a, all right, a all rebuttal right. a little bit? All right. <laughs> I, I just don't want to leave the audience with something that I think is a misconception. I agree with Shelley on almost everything. And for sure on the GME, we absolutely need it. And it is in the governor's budget. So, I, and it does look like it's going through. What I disagree with is that primary care is all we need. We need specialty care in this city as well. Well, you do one first and then the other. And you're right, we need them both. You take <laughs> no. money from primary care and you don't get the pipeline that refers to let me just tell you why we need specialties now, too. Because almost half of the students that, that went to uh, Reno, University of Nevada, Reno School of Medicine, left the state because the specialty training they wanted isn't given in the state. So to actually fix the students leaving the state, they have to have specialty residents. And if you look at the medical care that's missing, it's the highest level of medical care that doesn't exist at all. Things like liver transplants, bone marrow transplants, pancreas transplants, a heart failure program with an external pump. Those are all programs that need to be here in Las Vegas and you shouldn't have to leave. Even insurance companies have to pay to send people out of state for those kinds of things. So we really need the other residencies. And just to tell you what residencies are missing in this state, some very basic things like a nephrology fellowship for one is missing. But things like dermatology, ophthalmology, neurosurgery, cardiac surgery, um, orth orthopedics just started, so we now have that. Um, all of the radiology, anesthesia, pathology, radiation oncology, I could probably name a lot more, and there's not a single pediatric fellowship and only three medicine fellowships. So if you want to, uh, there's no oncology cancer fellowship. So, all of those need to be built in this city and as fast as they can be built. And I will say that depending on what charts you look at, if you look at a national average of, of specialty versus primary care, we're uh, more scarce in, in specialties. If you look at the Mountain West, which includes things like Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana, primary care is more. Uh, comparing us to them is really more in demand, but it just goes to show that the region as a whole needs more specialty care. So couldn't leave it without that. This is so and, important. And in four and years, when you graduate your first class, Barbara, I think we should start those specialties. Right now, let's get the primary <laughs> care physicians. Let, let's be real. We need all of them, yeah. and we need them all now. So please talk to the governor, talk to your legislators, let's get the GME funded, let's get the medical school funded, and let's just get this done. So people quit getting on the airplane to go get their care. That should not be okay for us in this city anymore. And all of these people are completely dedicated to turning that ship around. But it takes every citizen to care and act. That is the perfect summary. Let's transition to you guys. We do have a question uh, from the audience. Team Kajet, there we go. All right, fire away. Rachel Dahl, Mesquite Regional Business. We're about an hour east of here, and we feel the same way, except people get in their car and come here for medical care. So is there going to be an effort to reach out to rural Clark County communities? Can we have some residencies in Mesquite and Boulder City and Laughlin? and some of our other partners. I can start out saying that I think the, big, the biggest thing that could help rural Clark County and rural Nevada is telemedicine, and I think that's really the thing of the future. And that's something that's really good for um, urban areas, too. For follow-up, you need to be see a doctor in person the first time, but often for follow-up, especially of chronic diseases, it could happen in your home and save you the drive and save you save you the parking and so on. Um, let me echo what Barbara is saying. Uh, Turo is very aggressively moving into telemedicine. I think it is very important if there are not enough um, health care providers and there are not in the state of Nevada, um, a, the, a very good way, it's not the ideal perfect way, but a very good way to access health care and to speak to a health care provider is through telemedicine. So we are also moving in that direction very, very rapidly and very aggressively. Excellent. Um, I know we're running short on time, so we're going to cut, uh, cut this segment short and give this group 
a huge round of applause. Can you join me? Thank you so much. Excellent. All right, I hope you can see how critical healthcare is to our economy and to really to our community and to getting to that next level. I hope you learned something there. Um, we're gonna move on to our first keynote. And uh, I wanna introduce uh, this by saying, a, a friend once told me, You'll know when you have arrived in Las Vegas when Jeremy Aguero considers you a friend, <laughs> right? I, I believe that's, that's kind of true. And I am proud to say, uh, Jeremy, I consider you a friend. You're one of the smartest people I know. Uh, this is the presentation that I know you guys really keep coming back for year after year that makes perspective great. Let's give a warm welcome to Jeremy Aguero with Applied Analysis. Good morning. I appreciate everybody being here today. Um, as Jonas, uh, my very good friend, indicated, um, uh, my job is to come up here and provide you somewhat of an overview in terms of where we are as an economy and where we think that we're ultimately heading. Before I do that, Jonas was so nice to say thank you to our firm and the other sponsors that we have and everyone being here, but he would never... Um, um, be so presumptive as to say, uh, to mention the LVGEA and all the wonderful things that they do and their entire staff does to put on this event. Please uh, give them a round of applause. In, in developing my presentation today, the, the title of my presentation is coming uh, full circle. It occurs to me that our community is going through some unique brand of post-traumatic stress, excuse me, uh, <laughs> yeah, me too, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder in terms of this ability to start to conceptualize the fact that our economy is no longer in recession, that we're starting to move forward. And the questions that I get are relatively uh, similar. Hey, look, what's going to happen next? When are we going to fall off this cliff? Are we growing too fast? Does this mean we're getting out of over our skis? Are we just setting ourselves up to happen again? Should I invest? All of those type of things seem to be this recurring set of questions. And so I'd like to take some time to put some of those at rest. And I understand why we got to this point. Let's not forget about all of the articles that came out for the better part of a five-year period, right? Crowds return, but where no one's going to gamble. The housing market continues to slide. Las Vegas economy absolutely in free fall. My personal favorite, Las Vegas economy among the worst in the world, report says. Now, I can think of lots of places on planet Earth. Many of them end with something like Stan, Kazakhstan, you know, whatever, that I don't even ever believe that we are the worst on planet Earth. And then the other one that was out there was, of course, Las Vegas from Time Magazine, where Joel Stein called Las Vegas the uh, world's greatest uh, ghost town in waiting. Right? This is why we continue to have this type of concern. And I get it. I get that the economic downturn was significant. I get that it created a lot of stress for us in here. But the fact that this room is filled with so many familiar faces among people who found a way to make it work, I think is something we should be very proud of. And I think being realistic about where we are is important because this community will not be judged based on our ability to survive a recession. Our community will be judged on the ability to sustain our prosperity. That is what you heard today, and that is what we need to do as a community. I'm going to start with population growth because our community is geared for exactly that. We are designed to grow. We have been among the nation's fastest growing for decades and decades and decades, and here we are still again. What I'd like to do is just show you the population growth during sort of the boom period, and then you see that it sort of flattens out a little bit, and here we are again. And today, we are a community of 2. 2 million people overall. 2.2 million people call this place home. Now, it's the same 500 people that you see everywhere you go. I get that, okay? But there really are 2.2 million people that physically live in this community. Now, I went relatively fast through this, and if I was to go back through it, you'd see that the demographics, and I'll go backward because my guys were so nice to create this. 
if you look on the right side of my chart, that's the shares in terms of races, in terms of our de demographics, if you will. And we look at 2000, and then we look at 2006, and then we look at 2012, and then where we are today, we are becoming increasingly diverse. We are minority, majority, all of those type of things. This diversity is what makes our community great. It is part of who we are. It is the fabric of our society, and there is nothing wrong with it. And as a matter of fact, we only today are starting to embrace that and carry it forward. These are the 35 largest metropolitan areas in the United States. We are the third fastest growing of all of them. Not a bad place to be. Where are newcomers coming from? There's no surprise here. If we want to think about it in terms of full circle, yes, people did not move to Southern Nevada when the economy was going down. Why did they not move? Because they weren't moving anywhere, because their house was underwater. That's why people weren't moving, and now they're moving again. And guess where they're coming for? from? Excuse me, California, because it's the seventh largest economy on planet Earth, and people can't get out of there fast enough, all of which is fine. Right? But it's benefiting us. But more important than this idea of full circle is how we've changed in that. Let's just take a look at what those newcomer trends look like throughout the years. In 2000, look at what the income level was. Look at the age of people moving in. What we know is that today, people are moving into our community to find jobs that are at a higher level, and they're bringing more income with them. They're also bringing more home equity with them. And surprisingly enough, there actually appears to be some millennials that are moving out of their parents' house because they appear to be moving here, right? If you look at the far right at 2016, the age at which people are moving in is dropping for every reason, and the LVGEA has been absolutely a leader on this, is the reality that we cannot create as many professionals as we need in this community. Things like GME and others are essentially a roadblock, and so we are going to have to attract talent particularly from around the Western United States, and they're coming here. And they're coming here because the, we offer a better way of life overall. If we transition from this idea of population to this concept of employment, right, the number one motivation for people moving into our community, as it has been for most of the past 37 years, has been this idea of finding a job probably much longer uh, than that, but this idea of finding a job. And if we look at how we are creating jobs and where we've been, this idea of sort of coming all the way back around, this is what job growth looked in 2007. Most of the folks here remember what 2007 was like. Jobs were plentiful. The unemployment rate was approaching 4%. Everybody that wanted a job could find a job, uh, except perhaps for my brother-in-law, and, 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 and it was fine, right? It was good. Right, we were growing at 4.3 percent. We were the we were the fifth fastest growing metropolitan area, excuse me, state in the nation. And here we look at it, 2011, when the world is kind of coming apart, and only North Dakota has positive growth. Right, you know. Yeah, there's a lot of jokes there. We'll just leave it, leave it there. And then you look at 2017, and here we are again. Here we are again at the now the third fastest growing state in the entire United States, and that's great. And that full circle is what is important to us, but the nature of it, what is underlying it, is the reason that we can at least exhale a little bit and say we are learning to do it better as we go forward. Let's just talk about that for a moment. Now, here's the pre-recession um, growth in employment for the top 35 MSAs. I guess I should show this in advance of showing um, how we're changing to make sure that I'm showing sort of an apples to apples comparison. So we were just looking at states. We're now looking at MSAs. You can see there's only one large MSA uh, to the right of us in 2007. We're dead last in the in among large MSAs in 2011. And here we are today at about three, uh, a little over 3% employment growth, which I'm sure my good friends at the Nevada Department of Employment, Training, and Rehabilitation that are here today um, would tell you that is pretty darn good growth overall, and we like it. So we look at where we are in terms of having created all of those jobs, right? Here's our last peak. There it is in May of 2007 when we had about, uh, let's call it 940,000. Today, we're, let's call it 980,000. We have 40,000 more jobs today in our community than we did then. On the far right-hand side of my chart, of course, is what sectors are showing the greatest growth. And I think this is part of the angst that we have. 
the number one growth sector that we had over the past 12 months has been construction. We had 8,500 jobs. And I am here to tell you that as we're going through this exercise, by the time we get to the end of this year, our community is going to be 10,000 construction workers short of the number we're going to need to keep pace with all the projects that we have. And if there's some construction folks in the room, they're probably going to tell you that I'm light on that number and we're already 10,000 construction workers short of hitting that number. Look at the other areas that we're growing, professional and business services, leisure and hospitality, education and healthcare, all expanding. Let's take a look at the unemployment rate, right? Our unemployment rate, of course, was always approaching 15% at the peak of the market. The green area at the bottom shows the differential between our unemployment rate and the United States unemployment rate, which I will argue would be almost more important than anything else that's on this chart. Why? Because that led to an out-migration of folks and was part of the reason that we lost one out of every eight private sector jobs in Southern Nevada during the peak of the recession. Today, we've gotten almost all of it back. We are doing well. We are at near full employment, if not at full employment, and that is extremely positive overall. Look at where we were, where we're headed, all those type of things. Now, I understand that this chart is, is there's a lot of colors and a lot of numbers, all those type of things, and I'd like to talk about it just for a moment, that those sort of big green blocks, that's leisure and hospitality, right? This shows us how many employees we have in every sector of the economy. You can see the big green block is still the big green block. You will also see that if we look at 2007 versus 2017, that the yellow area, which is education and health services, um, which of course you just heard a great deal about, is getting larger. We still have only 70% of the healthcare economy we should for an area of our size, and that is hugely problematic, although you will notice that the yellow area has gotten increasingly bigger. Now, I'm really glad that Shelly clarified in terms of what nephrology is, because there's been growth there, and I was really wondering what the hell was going on. <laughs> right? Uh, so I, I'm, I'm glad I now have all of that straight. But at the end of the day, the one that we probably care about the most is this one, which is why we created the chart in the first place, and that's the idea of construction. So if construction is now at the top of our list, are we getting out over our skis? Do we have this huge problem? In 2007, you can see that 11.2% of our employment was in construction. At the bottom of the market, it was 4.8%. Today, we're 6.3%. And on the right-hand side of my chart, I think, is what is critically important. I just told you we have 40 thousand more employees than we did at the prior peak of our economy. We did that with 40,000 fewer construction workers in our economy. At its peak, that was 105,000. Today, it's 61,000. Not a bad place for us to be, and I would argue significantly more healthy than where we were going in to the economic downturn. Now, let's, let's take a look at what the U.S. averages are for each one of those. 5.6%, 3.9%, and 4.6%. Okay, we'll take it. That number starts, that 6.3% on that one on the right, starts to approach 8%. We need to start having a conversation about it in our community. That is the level of growth that will start to be unsustainable and something we'll need to keep an eye on. If we look at it in terms of the demand for space, right? Is this creation of jobs and what we're developing leading to this demand for space? This chart has all kinds of information on it. The vacancy rate and how many employees are office using and how many square feet they use and all those type of things, all of which is important and I appreciate my guys putting it on here. But what is critically important about this slide is that the little green line is above the little purple line, which means that we are demanding more office space than we are bringing on. Concurrent with this fact that we are growing more rapidly, we are also finding ways to utilize the existing space that we have, and we are being pragmatic in terms of how much we're bringing on. This chart shows the number of the amount of occupied space for every office using employee. At the peak of the market, sort of back, sort of looking far to the right, and then we go up into the recession, and that number gets to 130 square feet for every office using employee. Why does it get to that level? Because when you start laying people off, you got a lot of office space out there. Right? And so if we look today, we're now at about 110, which means we are utilizing our office space in a way that's almost equally effective to a period when the vacancy rate was, you know, let's call it sub-6% in our community. 
What we have is a disconnect between functional space and well-located space and non-functional space and stuff that's just not that well-located, and that's what we're seeing today, and so it's working out okay. And in addition to that, what we are building in our community are corporate headquarters. Build the suits, right? Some of the most phenomenal office developments in the entire Western United States are happening right in our backyard, not the least of which is something, uh, the, the UFC and aristocrat uh, facilities that are recently constructed. Now, the housing market seems to me to be something that's worthy of some extended discussion along the same lines. Why? Because housing was given all of the blame in terms of the economic downturn and seems to be getting zero of the credit in terms of coming back. We've saw, seen subdivisions have started to pop up and those type of things, which is creating some concern in terms of overbuilding within our market. Are prices getting out of line? Are we building too many houses? Should I buy a house? Is my house going to drop in value as a result? I hear this question at least three times a week. And so let me try and answer it to 500 people at one time. Um, the, the critical way of looking at it is something we refer to as the EP ratio or the number of employees versus the number of permits that you're constructing. And forgive me for getting overly technical, but there are generally about 1.35 employees in every household. It's just the way it averages out. And so if that number gets out of whack, if you start to permit more than that, it becomes problematic. If you permit less than that, it becomes problematic from an over or under supply standpoint. Today, the little purple line is what Las Vegas is doing in terms of the EP ratio, which means that there are 2.4 employees for every home that we are constructing. Today, with everything that we're seeing, we're not building enough homes for all of the employees that we are generating. And a matter of fact, if we look at the, the green line, which represents the United States as a whole, the U.S. is building about 1.74, 1.75 houses for, uh, excuse me, employees generate one additional housing unit. We are under building our residential today, which leaves us with some degree of comfort overall. In terms of housing affordability, is it getting out of whack? The answer is really no. You can see places like the, the bigger numbers are actually better here, so don't re excuse me, don't read this in any way incorrectly. You see San Francisco, Los Angeles, and San Jose are at the bottom in terms of housing opportunity. Can people actually afford a house? No, they cannot in those markets. Can they in our market? Yes, they can. If we look at the housing price index, we're not even back to where we were overall. Now, if we think about it in terms of this coming full circle, let's make sure that we are clear here in terms of how it all played out. This is 2004, excuse me, 2003 to 2004, arguably the peak of the housing market, the prior peak of the housing market. Nevada was number one in the United States with annual appreciation of 37.2%. If anyone believes that appreciation of 37.2% is in any way sustainable, we can have a conversation after this meeting, okay? It's just not, right? So now let's fast forward to the bottom of the market. We go from number one in the United States, we go all the way down to number 50 in the United States. We drop by 25.7%. Of course, that's dramatic. Everyone's concerned. So where are we today? The most recent numbers place us in the top five. Yes, I would prefer to be in the top 10 than the top five, but that number is 8%, right? much more sustainable than something that's measured with a, you know, than 38% or 28% or even 18%. We'll take it, right? We understand where it is, and it's certainly not as nearly as out of whack as some have suggested. Now, arguably most important here is this idea that people see building permits are going up and they're rising by double-digit rates, and we're seeing all these subdivisions come out, and we're hearing about all of these new communities that are out here. These are new home market closings, right? How many housing units we are building and are being sold in the market? On the left-hand side of the chart is what it looked like when we were going nuts, right? Over 40,000 housing units were being constructed. The past 12 months, that number is 8,300 in our community today. Again, the idea that we are getting out over our skis, that it's becoming increasingly problematic. Yes, we have things to be concerned about, but I think we should take a deep breath and not be scared by our prosperity. Again, we will be defined by our ability to sustain that prosperity over time. 
On the far right-hand side of my chart is the median price for um, newly constructed homes. You can see that we're almost back to peak. Of course, you also have 10 years worth of inflation in there, and the reality is that home builders are just simply building bigger homes today than they did a decade ago. So again, we're not even very concerned about that number. And for most of us sitting in the room, we're much more concerned about existing homes than we are new construction because that affects each one of us or many of us, I'm sure. If you look at the number on the right, excuse me, the numbers on the left, that reflects how many closings are out there, very consistent with what we'd expect. And on the right hand side is what we call the roller coaster of doom. Okay? And what the roller coaster of doom means is that if you look on the far left hand side of that chart, this is what median closing prices were all the way back in 03. And if you, that little red line represents a 3% growth rate, which is pretty much exactly how housing prices have appreciated over time for the past 50 years. Now we have a period with a huge boom. We have a period with a huge bust. You wipe all of that out over about a 12 year period, 13 year period, and what happens? We're exactly back to the 3% growth rate that we should have been at the outset. It's just markets doing what they do. And if we look at new homes as a percentage of existing homes, are we getting out over our skis in terms of the amount of construction versus existing inventory? It is 14.5%, nowhere near what it was at the peak of the market when it approached 60% of existing inventory. Land, land availability becomes this big concern. I've heard rumblings about the fact that we have to go to the federal government and get them to release more land to drive down prices because the, those prices are coming up. This is the price of land that you see here. We have excluded residential, excuse me, resort casino development that's in there. So you get the idea. You see that in 2007, the average price of land was $800,000 an acre. We all remember the land auctions and the like. And now I'm gonna lay over the top of that, median new home price and median existing home price. We'll look at the expansion. We'll look at the peak. We'll look at the contraction. We'll look at the trough and where we are today. That is a very normal cycle and that frankly on the right hand side of my chart the distance between the price of land and the price of housing is where we would like it to be on this chart. Now I'm not going to say that I'm not somewhat concerned about the fact that land prices are escalating but nonetheless you get the idea of where we are versus where we were when things were overheated. Now if we start to see a trend that looks like what we saw in 5, 6, and 7 it's time to bring the fire trucks up to the front. We cannot fear our prosperity as a community. There are today 71,500 developable acres uh, in Southern Nevada. Uh, we're developing about 5,000 of those every year. That's what these charts show. And so we have about 14 years worth of effective inventory left if we average everything out. Not bad and where we want to be. If we look at this idea of, well, we hear all the time that incomes are not keeping pace, that housing prices are going up, but all of our incomes are remaining, they're remaining flat. I read yesterday that incomes haven't gone up since 2000 or something along those lines. Number one, that's not right. Number two, let's just take a look at it. Here's household income versus home price. This is what it was prior uh, to 2004. This is when incomes outstripped um, housing prices. Of course, this is during the boom uh, period. This is when home prices outstripped incomes, when the world is coming apart, and here's where we are today. That green zone is what we would refer to as the safe zone, and you will also notice that those numbers are going down, not going up, which is something that you know we, we, we certainly want to keep an eye on, but we're not outside of where we should be. The number of homes available for sale is 1.64 in terms of, of uh, available inventory. I've bifurcated that into the two component parts. Lower priced homes under 300,000 are on the right hand side. Um, uh, higher priced homes are on the, uh, excuse me, are above. Higher priced homes are beneath there. And you can see that there are greater inventory of higher priced homes. Shockingly, there are fewer buyers for million dollar homes and therefore the inventory tends to stay a little higher. Ah, right, uh, the homeowner equity, right? Here's where we were in 2009, 10, 11, 12, right? And just to be clear, we want positive, we don't want negative. The green can get as big as it wants to get, right? Here we are in 13, 14, 15, and 16. Again, we've made huge strides in terms of reversing this trend. This is the mix of property sold. Green is good. Everything else really bad. We want green to be big. We want everything else to be small. You can see where we are. 
If we look at it instead of looking at some of these markets and we start going to the basics, what are consumers doing overall? This is Clark County's taxable retail sales overall, right? And we are $4 billion. That's $4 billion among the high, higher than we have ever been before. Eating and drinking places, auto sales, general merchandise are all up. Clothing and accessories are dropping. Not because people aren't buying them. I assure you they are. My wife and daughter single-handedly trying to keep the economy afloat, right? They're just doing it online. Okay, we get it. Autos are slowing a little bit. Nationally, some here. That's to be expected after seven record years. That's okay. That's what we should be doing. But if we're going to look at it in terms of this full circle concept, where are we relative to this? This is inflation-adjusted per capita taxable spending. So are we getting out ahead of ourselves or not? So let's just draw the average over the 30-year period. We remain below the average today, which means that spending could escalate some and we would still be in the healthy zone. That area with the peaks up there, 04, 05, and 06, or if we get anywhere near that, it's time to have a conversation overall. And we know that taxable retail sales are changing. We get it. The red area is non-store retailers. You will refer to them as places like Amazon and things like that, right? You get this idea. They're growing. These other ones are not growing quite as quickly. Okay, that's just things are changing, and we know that we're sort of trading this bricks and mortar retail for more distribution space. So let's take a look at whether our economy is adapting to this new reality. On the left-hand side is retail. On the right-hand side is industrial. Yes, the retail rate is elevated, but dropping. The industrial area where retailers are now actually doing their retailing, essentially fulfillment centers, if you will, are down to 6.9% overall. If we look at completions versus absorption, are the green line and the purple line aligned with one another, like we talked about with the office market? Yes, they are. If we look at planned and under construction, no, we're not building retail because we shouldn't, right? And on the other side, we're building industrial because that's where everybody is going. And yes, it is at peak levels. Currently, under construction space is sourced 100% to distribution centers exactly how it should be overall. And if we're asking the question about whether we're getting out over our skis, whether we're building too much, Let's look at whether the future development as a share of planned inventory for retail in the peak period, we, were, we essentially had under construction 36% of our market. Today it's 7.3. For industrial, we had 14%. Today we're at 11, again, well within the range of normalcy. We look at large store closings and this makes us nervous and we tend to ignore that the guys on the right are building and occupying, or occupying and maybe not building, 2 million square feet in the last year alone. This is simply a transitional step relative to our economy overall. Now, wrap all that up is the, the big green area that I showed you on my chart had to do with tourism and tourism-related activity. Our growth in visitor volume is significant, and it continues to be incredibly important to us, and I'd like, I think talking about that is critical. One in six people, one in six people that puts a head in a bed on any given night is not a resident of Southern Nevada. That's how big our visitor economy is, and that is bigger than almost anywhere else in the entire United States. Where are they coming from? Uh, Western United States. We want to get that international all the way up to 30. We're working on it, but we're setting records relative to visitation overall, and in particular, convention visitors who spend more, generate more, stay longer, all those things than their traditional le leisure counterparts. McCarran International Airport is today the eighth busiest airport in the entire United States. It's the second largest destination and origination, I should say that differently, origination and destination airport in the United States. Someone is going to have to explain to me why we care about someone flying into an airport, staying on a plane, and flying somewhere else, right? Makes no sense to me whatsoever, but we count it. Anyway, this is when we take all of that out. We'll take the people that stay. Someone else can, Atlanta can have all the people that just want to go through. Whatever, right? 
The LVCVA is absolutely, uh, should be commended for being able to expand our, our international reach with all of these new flights, including ones to Beijing, China, which will be critically important overall. And again, thinking about it in terms of coming full circle, on the left-hand side of my chart is the occupancy rate. On the right-hand side is the average daily room rate. These are the two factors that will become, that will become critical in determining whether we make reinvestments here. We are approaching 90%, not quite where we were, but approaching 90%. And on the right-hand side, ADR is $128 per night, almost back to the peak. But something we didn't have in 2007 and 2008 is the resort fee, which is also added on, which means we are at peak ADR today. All of that having been said, let's wrap it all up and put a bow on it because everyone wants to focus, at least the national media does, on this concept that gaming revenue is below where it should be or has not grown. Ignoring the fact that Las Vegas Strip total revenue is up to $11.2 billion. Not only the highest level that it's ever been, but blowing the previous uh, peak out of the water. If we look at the amount of development, and I will tell you Jonas's map is much more extensive than this, and you should really take a look at it because I think it's super cool. But if we look at it in terms of development that has recently happened on the Strip, or is occurring there, $7.8 billion. And I talk a lot about the amount of development that's happening in our community because I think it's great. But if we're going to ask the question is, are we building too much? Here's what those numbers looked like in 2007 when we had $45.8 billion worth of projects on the books. $45.8 billion. How much do we have today? $14.1 billion on the books. There are communities all over the United States that would give their eye teeth to have $14.1 billion worth of projects on the books. But before we freak out about the fact that we're all building too much and there's not going to be enough glass and not enough concrete and we just can't handle this much growth, I think we should put it all in a little bit of perspective. And what we are building is based on bringing people here for special events, stadiums, convention centers, all those things, because we have assets that we can leverage. 150,000 hotel rooms, the second busiest airport in the United States, restaurants, all, dining, all those type of things. But Las Vegas is just as important for those events as, as we are to them as they are to us. It's a symbiotic relationship. I hear it all the time because of the work we do on the stadium and other things. On the left-hand side is the Pac-12 tournament. These are the attendance numbers when it was in Los Angeles. The numbers on the right-hand side are the attendance numbers when it came to Las Vegas. What about the Mountain West tournament? Las Vegas, uh, 2000 to 03, they move to Denver. Surprise, surprise, they move it back. This is why it works. Terrence is telling me that I have to wrap it up, so I'm going to go a little bit quickly, and you forgive me. He's great, and I, I need to get it done. The other side of this is that when we think about it overall, the economic implications of those special events are massive, right? Super Bowl, Houston, Texas, 138,000 Super Bowl visitors and $350 million of impact. That's why it was so great to see the article in the newspaper today that they're talking about potentially getting us a Super Bowl in 2000, 2023 or 2024. Hopefully it happens. But we cannot forget about the fact that while Houston was hosting the Super Bowl with 138,000 people, we had 300,000 people that showed up for Super Bowl weekend right while we were here. Almost done, I promise. Convention centers are phenomenal. We have among the best in the entire country. We have been atop the list for the past 22 years, and the business tax climate has benefited from this amount. We, the, re, the tourists generate $2 billion in taxes for us every single year. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here other than saying those are all of the states that have an individual income tax, and we're not one of them because 43 million people decided to get in a car or get in a plane and come here and spend money. And if you don't believe me, this is what your sales tax rates, property tax rates, and personal income tax would, rate would be if they didn't exist today. We need to preserve that sector of our economy at all costs. Those are huge numbers. These are the companies we're bringing in. Northern Nevada is also getting them. We are innovating overall. These are companies. We all know them. They're making great steps and great progress. But I do not want to minimize small business development in our community. 
We have more businesses here than we have ever had before. We've created 9,200 businesses since 2010. Thank you to the LVGEA because they have been critical as well as each one of you in making that happen overall. My friends at Nevada State Bank asked for this idea of, of how are small business folks thinking about all of this. We asked them, are you optimistic about the economy? They are more optimistic than they have been at any point in the past five years. Do you plan to expand over the next 12 months? Do you think things are going to get better over the 12, next 12 months? Yes, they do. In closing, yes, things are okay. We're doing better. We're, we're finding our footing. But I'm always reminded of the salient words, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. We cannot ignore where we were when all of the development we couldn't handle, so we were spilling over into Arizona. Um, Las Vegas uh, weighs billion-dollar uh, reliever airport, right? We, we don't have enough room at, at, at McCarran, so we're going to build Ivanpah, right? Least affordable real estate market in the United States. These are the type of articles that were coming out when we were at our absolute peak. We cannot let this happen again. Las Vegas closing on another full house. I love that they have to come up with some type of gambling analogy no matter what they write. Anyway, that's my own personal problem. Condomania in the West. And as we all remember, the Manhattanization of Las Vegas, right? This is a map. We actually have been doing this presentation since 2007. This is my 10th year doing it. And I'm very thankful uh, for that. This is a map we used in the very first one of all the planned, proposed, or under construction uh, condos that were in Southern Nevada. Almost none of them were actually built, right? This is where we can't go because we've got to come full circle. So let's just fix, let's talk just for one minute, and I promise I'll get down from where we are. Downtown Summerlin stalled during the economic downturn. This is what it looks like today. We can be proud of that. The folks at Summerlin should be incredibly proud of that. Yeah, thank you. Right. Oh. Anyway, they know the statistics. I don't even see Manhattan West stalled during the economic downturn. This is what it looks like today. Here's the Kyle Canyon master plan. 1,700 acres was foreclosed on. Here's what it looks like today. The folks in the city of Las Vegas think Stavros uh, was here. Uh, congratulations on what you guys have been able to do. Echelon stalled during economic downturn. Recently announced that they're getting that project going forward, and it'll be happening pretty soon. Interstate 11, of course, have felt met any number of delays, and now is actually going to happen. City center, if anyone's ever heard Jim Murren talk about how close it was to closing down, it didn't. And not only have they finished that project, but they doubled down with building the T-Mobile Arena, which will probably be among the most productive arenas in the entire United States when everything's added up for its first year of operation. And the very last one, South Strip, right? This property was foreclosed on, 62 acres there off the freeway. It's going to be the home of the new Las Vegas Stadium. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Sorry, Randy. Was that powerful? Did you enjoy that? Can we get another round of applause? Awesome. Awesome. For our next segment, you guys are in for a treat. We wanted to show you a look at the future of gaming. We have the best expert in the entire country to talk to you about that particular project. Jeff Freeman is the CEO of the American Gaming Association. He is a global leader. He is responsible for positioning commercial and tribal gaming for success, and he's also a powerhouse speaker. Please help me welcome to the stage, Jeff Freeman. So I'm thinking of starting every speech with that sex with a dead person joke. It's bound to get some laughs. Congresswoman Berkeley had to leave, so it's even better I say this in her absence. I've been in Washington 20 years, and I've met with a lot of members of Congress. I have never met someone who was a greater champion for an industry, for a city, for a state than Congresswoman Berkeley was. She was a tremendous champion for this area, and it's something for which all of you should be quite proud. We have today great champions uh, from Nevada. We appreciate the support from Nevada, but not for one second should we forget what Congresswoman Berkeley did. It's also great to follow Jeremy. What great energy, what great uh, enthusiasm and passion uh, for this area. And the message that I heard there was fantastic about embrace the prosperity. Embrace what this area, this region has accomplished. 
figure out how we sustain that, figure out how we capitalize on it. You know, that same message actually applies to the gaming industry, and I'm excited to talk a little bit about that today. But before I get started, I just want to thank Jonas. I want to thank the LVGEA. I really appreciate the invitation here. and want to congratulate you for everything you've done in this area, supporting the economy here in Nevada. I represent a national industry. I'm based in Washington, uh, a national organization. But I believe everything we're doing, whether we're doing it in Nevada, New Jersey, where I'll be tonight in Atlantic City, uh, or whether we're doing it in Missouri or any other state that's gaming, it all comes back to helping Las Vegas. It all comes back to helping Nevada. So let me talk a little bit about who this industry is right now, where we're going, and the great opportunities we have ahead. Because this is an exciting time in the gaming industry. Not just because we've got great new properties opening, we've got new markets emerging. We've got a former casino owner as president of the United States. <laughs> and whatever you might think of President Trump, for this industry, that only says opportunity that only says we've got an opportunity to do something great that we haven't had before. So let's talk about why we have that opportunity because I think it's important that we embrace that and then let's talk about how we capitalize on it. This industry today, this industry that just started right here in Nevada, is today a $240 billion industry across 40 states in the US. 1.7 million jobs supported, nearly $40 billion in tax revenue, this industry is a major economic force, and it's only growing. In the latest year for which we have data available, commercial gaming did $39 billion in revenue, tribal gaming, $30 billion in revenue, nearly $70 billion in revenue between these, uh, these two entities, commercial and tribal. This is a massive economic force in communities across the country. And that economic footprint now speaks to the increasing mainstream nature of our industry. You know, when you, you look at the critics of gaming, the critics of gaming only exist in the communities in which we don't do business. In the communities in which casinos operate, we're strong community partners and we are incredible economic generators. And that's a big part of the opportunity we have ahead. The second part of the opportunity we have ahead, and more to that mainstream nature of this industry, is the improving perception of this industry. As all of you know, this October, the Vegas Golden Knights will kick off their inaugural season. The Raiders will arrive in one, two, three years, a stadium not too far after that. We had a presidential debate last year here in Las Vegas. And as I said, we have a president who's a former casino owner and one of the most amazing aspects about that, and there are a lot of amazing aspects about that, one of the most amazing aspects about that, the act of owning casinos never came up during the campaign. The act of managing and the ability to manage it came up a couple times, but the act of owning casinos never came up. So just as Jeremy was talking about the prosperity here in, in Las Vegas and in this area, think about the prosperity of 2016. Think of all the things that happened in that year and ask yourself, would that have happened 10 years ago? Would it have happened five years ago? In your wildest dreams, did you think all of these things would happen just last year? This industry has come incredibly far in terms of being a mainstream player in the American economy, in terms of being accepted coast to coast. 85% of the American public now saying that they're perfectly comfortable with casinos for themselves, their friends, their family. We're mainstream, how do we take advantage of it? These are the external factors that are helping us as an industry. There are also several, I think, internal, in, excuse me, internal factors, intra-industry factors that are changing who we are. Increasingly, and I want to talk about these three, increasingly, we're a unified industry. For those of you that have been in Las Vegas for some time, for those of you that have been close to the gaming industry, you know that unity, collaboration, these are not hallmarks of the casino gaming industry. But they are critical to our future success. I often talk about, and my own team asks me not to talk about it, but we're much better at having a circular firing squad in this industry than we are about getting in a straight line and focusing on a common target. Increasingly, we're identifying who and what that common target is. The American Gaming Association of today, my organization was created, it was modeled after the Motion Picture Association. 
And if you know anything about that organization, Jack Valenti created it years ago. It was the six big studio heads in, in Los Angeles. And they created this organization in Washington and they sent them one of two messages. Either do what we tell you to do or leave us the hell alone. That was the MPAA message. AGA simplified that. It created the big, you know, the big six from here on the Las Vegas Strip. It had one simple message for Washington, leave us the hell alone. And that was the exclusive club that the AGA was. Today we're different. Today we represent that unified industry that gaming is becoming. We represent 90% of all the revenue in commercial gaming, 95% of all the supplier revenue uh, that's critical to this industry. We represent with just 10 prominent tribes in our organization, a third of all tribal gaming revenue. The industry is increasingly on the same page and getting in that straight line to focus its sights on issues of common cause. So I'm gonna go back there. The second aspect of that that we're doing as an industry is we're beginning to gain confidence. We're beginning to gain a sense that we can go get stuff done. In 2016 alone, this industry staved off three critical attacks from Washington. One, an effort to suggest that our industry didn't take its anti-money laundering compliance efforts seriously. A sense that this industry was not committed to strict regulation and a threat of hundreds of millions of dollars in fines from the federal government. When the head of the agency in Washington left her role after getting to know this industry and getting exposed to the people in this industry, her message was, your industry actually has a good story to tell. Our industry, the gaming industry, is now a model for others in financial services as to how to do anti-money laundering compliance right. When the IRS said we want to lower slot tax thresholds from $1,200 to $600, and we want to use all those loyalty marketing cards that many of you probably play with, we want to use those to track what people are doing in the casinos. That was the proposal from the IRS. This industry stood up, it worked in a collaborative fashion, it prevented that from happening. Also last year when the federal government set out to eliminate those resort fees that Jeremy mentioned, resort fees that not everyone likes but are worth a half a billion dollars on the Las Vegas Strip alone, this industry worked together to prevent that from happening. Three critical successes that were only made possible because of the unity of the industry and three critical successes that give the industry confidence, heck, we can do a lot more. We can make other great things happen. The other great thing that I think positions us for future success is we're not putting our head in the sand. We see what's coming down the pike. We see what the new issues are that are emerging. We see the development of daily fantasy sports and esports and skill-based games. Outside Nevada, the, the development of what's called convenience gaming, retail gaming, distributed gaming, whatever you want to call it, machines and bars and taverns around the country. We realize these challenges are out there and we're confronting them head on. We're asking ourselves, if we're a $240 billion industry today, how do we become a $300 billion industry tomorrow? And how do we work with these newfound challenges that are out there? It's that type of bold thinking and leadership that I think sets this industry with these other factors, sets this industry up for tremendous success in the future. I think we are paved to do, positioned to do, great things in the years ahead. And two areas I wanna highlight for you, and you might be thinking to yourself, well, we have these things in Nevada, so why does that matter to me? I'm gonna close by coming back why these things that are gonna happen elsewhere in the United States matter, and matter in a very good way, right here in Nevada. The first tremendous opportunity in front of this industry is to take what Nevada has today, a legal, regulated sports betting market, and permit every state in the country to opt into this if they so choose. You know, there was a long time where Nevada felt, hey, we've got a monopoly on sports betting, why would we wanna share this with anybody else? We get all those people coming here for the Super Bowl. We get people coming here for March Madness. Maybe we won't have people coming here if sports betting is permitted elsewhere. Well, here's the dirty truth. There's no monopoly here in Nevada. Last year, $4.7 billion was wagered on the Super Bowl. 3% of that was wagered legally here in Nevada. $160 billion was spent on sports betting across the United States. 3% of that was done legally here in Nevada. Americans are finding a way to wager on sports. There is incredible demand to be involved in these games. Daily fantasy sports, which got all the attention, is the tip of the iceberg when it comes to how people want to be engaged in games today. And the question becomes, how do we open up these other markets around the country 
to enjoy this same product, to regulate this product, to prove that they can regulate effectively sports the same way they regulate every other form of gaming. I think we're on the cusp of doing that. You've got league leaders coming out and saying it's time for regulation. Adam Silver of the NBA leading the way and others following. You've got law enforcement increasingly coming to the table to say that our resources are best spent, not trying to track down uh, illegal sports bettors, but to focus on other more serious crimes. You've got states and municipalities, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, the National Conference of State Legislators, and many others saying it's time to regulate in this area. I think, and I have said publicly, in the first term of the Trump administration, sports betting will be legalized, or at least Washington will get out of the way to empower other states to have sports betting. Now, a disclaimer, when I said that, I didn't realize this first term might be shorter than usual. I think we will get this done. I'm confident that we will get this done. It is a multi-billion dollar growth opportunity for the industry around the country, and it's a growth opportunity right here in Nevada. The other thing we have to do as an industry, absolutely have to do, and this is where in many senses Nevada is a model, we have to improve, reform the regulation that guides this industry in the other 40 states in which we're doing business. You know, when casino gaming expanded beyond Nevada and New Jersey, and it went into these other states. These other states thought they were bringing in a great evil, a great sin, and they wanted to do everything they could to, to get the revenue from it, but paralyze every other activity there uh, with it. The speed to market of new machines, the ability to innovate with new products in these other markets is quite difficult. The ability to reinvest in your product when you have 50, 60% tax rates in these other states is quite difficult. Our future success as an industry demands that we modernize these regulations in every other state in which we're doing business. Now, the obvious question on all these modernizing regulations and sports betting, why is that good for Nevada? Two reasons. One, as we've seen the gaming industry thrive in other communities around this country, Nevada's success has only increased. Upwards of 50 million visitors now to Las Vegas. There was a fear when tribal gaming came on in California that we'd see a decline in visitation to Las Vegas. I don't think anyone's making that argument today. As gaming thrives in other markets, as gaming goes mainstream, Nevada's success only increases. It is in Nevada's interest to see sports betting legalized elsewhere. We don't wanna be the anomaly. We don't wanna be this thing that's okay here but illegal everywhere else. We want what we do here to be common practice a mainstream industry. The second reason this is critical is so long as we have all these different policies and antiquated approaches to gaming everywhere outside Nevada, the ability to innovate in Nevada remains difficult. The cost to do this research and development, the cost to, to build these new products and, and really give tomorrow's customer what it is that they're looking for is extraordinarily difficult with the inefficiencies that we have across the country. The more we can streamline that, the more we can get a level playing field around the country Nevada, which is the home to so much of this innovation, the home to some of the biggest suppliers in this industry, stands to benefit. And that's why what is good for gaming outside of Nevada is good for Nevada. And it's our focus at the AGA. It's our focus every day to strengthen this industry. I'm confident that the future for the gaming industry has never been brighter. And the future right here in Nevada has never been brighter. The AGA is committed every day to working on behalf of the gaming industry, many of you in this room, to build an environment where the casino gaming industry can thrive. My ask of each of you in this room is to be our partner in doing that, to help us understand where are the challenges, where are the roadblocks, where are the issues that need to be addressed, because the industry has never been more capable to getting those roadblocks, those challenges out of the way. Right now, it's about capitalizing on the opportunity we have building on the success we've enjoyed and building the strongest industry that we can have in the years ahead. I'm confident that we're well on our way there. Thank you for the opportunity. I don't know if we want to take any questions, but I really appreciate the opportunity. Questions? Yeah. yeah, certainly. Excellent. We do have time for just a couple questions from the audience. We've got a roving mic out there. Jeff has graciously agreed to stay on for a couple minutes from the audience. That was a powerhouse presentation. First, can we give him another round of applause?
If no one has any questions, I see a couple of faces I recognize, including Marcus over there and a couple others. So I'll just call on you to ask questions. So. <laughs> Anybody? Going? Going once, going twice? All right. Thank you. Thank you very thank you. much. Appreciate Again, it. thank you, Jeff. I'm going to close with this. I hope you had fun this morning. I know I did. And it is our sincere hope that the perspectives you that you heard today will be of assistance as you make your critical decisions throughout the upcoming year. Again, thank you for coming. Have a good day.